Scott. Thank you. Now, I feel really fortunate to have stumbled into the game industry about uh, uh, 20 years and a month ago. Um, so, yes, that's old. But, uh, but the game industry has gone through a lot of transition, change, and excitement through that time. And, and um, what I want to do today is talk a little bit about the independent studio that we founded, a group of us, uh, started 11 years ago. And our ups, downs, some things we picked up along the way, some cool opportunities. We got to work with Valve on Counter-Strike. Today, we get to work on a lot of uh, virtual reality products and share some of the things that we've picked up along the way from that. It may be relevant to you. It may be just interesting. But hopefully, there's some impact, and we'll see. Um, so, um, so I, of course, like everyone else, I learned to program at age 10 in a church. Isn't that what normally happens? Um, there happened to be a guy in the, in the city I grew up in who sold a bunch of software and donated a bunch of computers to churches and then came in and taught fifth and sixth graders how to program in basic. And I just ate that up. I loved it. I loved video games. I loved everything else. But I never thought going to school for video games or was even a possibility. And when I talked to people about going to school for programming back in the day, it was talking about compilers and about the way chips were built. And that didn't seem very fun. I thought software was really cool as a tool to be able to use for things. So I actually went into aerospace engineering. I, I still got to do some programming, teach programming. Ended up staying for grad school, very focused on this technology career of spacecraft and research. And I took film classes on the side because I loved entertainment, loved technology. Um, but I thought tech would be the job and entertainment would be the, the hobby. And along the way, I ended up sitting next to a game producer from Sierra Online on one of many business trip flights. And we started talking about the video game industry. And I remember in 1997, when I left and joined Sierra Online, um, my parents said, are you sure about this? Are you sure you can make any money in the game industry? That sounds like it's just a fantasy. And today, of course, we think about it very, very differently. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. It's huge. There are opportunities. There are also challenges being in the video game industry today. But at that time, it was a ridiculous thing. I was really fortunate to program on a few games at Sierra, then become Sierra's first external producer. Sierra had always made games internally or bought companies, and they'd always made games internally. Then Sierra started working with companies like Valve for Half-Life or Gearbox for Half-Life Opposing Force, Relic for Homeworld. And they realized they didn't have any methods for interacting with them. Today, we know all about publishing organizations, but at that time, Sierra didn't really have anything like that. So I became Sierra's first external producer and started getting to know a lot of independent developers from the publisher side. And it was super interesting. As Vivendi purchased Sierra and it was going through a lot of changes, I joined Xbox, became part of a really cool group you may or may not have heard about. They're still going today. They're called the Advanced Technology Group. And they've done a lot of really interesting consulting worldwide, helping out game developers with their games. It was a really fun time and a really uh, eye-opening. And, and that's actually where this story starts. There was a group of us who had worked together at ATG and decided what we really wanted to do was go back to making games. And we talked about possibly doing that at Microsoft, but the, the politics of the environment didn't work for that. And so we set off to create our own studio and go off on our own grand epic adventure. And this was really pretty scary. There weren't a lot of game developers uh, that were independent and available in 2006. Um, but it turned out to be an actually an OK time to form a studio. Now, I don't know how many people here really remember 2006, so I'll take you back just a little bit. Um, Tom and Katie were getting married. That was a new thing. Jay Leno was the future of television. Uh, Brad and Angelina just had a baby girl. Heath Ledger just became famous for Brokeback Mountain. And uh, Don Chaney was showing everyone how he could be tough in international politics. At the same time, Time Magazine said, our kids, they might be wired for their own good, too wired. And they're talking about flip phones and iPods. Our world has changed just a little since then. Game industry was still pretty different. Windows Vista, the future of PC gaming. Ubisoft introduced a new uh, IP called Assassin's Creed. World of Warcraft was really starting to take off in its second year. Guitar Hero got a sequel. Microsoft introduced a new franchise called Gears of War. 
And GTA was one of the largest games that year. Nintendo released a new handheld with a brand new Zelda. And after 10 years of development, Prey came out. Oh, I know, that was just this year, too. But uh, sometimes things are different. Sometimes they're the same. But the world for games really was pretty darn different. Um, consoles were dominant. And even the console market wasn't very online. Only a third of people were connected at all, and then not consistently. Um, the console has the dominant market share, and we're talking about PS2, Xbox 360, which had just been introduced months earlier, and the Nintendo DS. The PS3 and Wii won't come out for another year. Um, Madden, Super Mario, Kingdom Hearts, the new Gears of War, GTA, those were the big titles of the year. And this Xbox Live Arcade thing that uh, Mr. Charla was once involved with, and he'll talk more about ID, had, was fairly new, had had the hot games of its day, Bejeweled, Hexic, Zuma. And th those were their top titles in Xbox. You really don't see indie games there at this point. So this is before that. Games for Gold, PS Plus, they, they don't exist. And on the PC side of things, Steam does exist, but it's really Half-Life 2, Counter-Strike, and a couple dozen other games. Um, you wouldn't find at that time in 2006 that many major titles outside of Valve's games on Steam at that point. Uh, obviously, it's changed quite a bit. PC online gaming is big in Asia, but there are many articles that the PC gaming is dead or dying in the United States, and people are talking about how it's completely going to go away. WoW started to change that, but that was really it for online PC gaming. And as I mentioned, indie gaming is not a category yet, and Kickstarter is six years away from even being founded. Monetization was pretty simple. You bought a game and you downloaded it, or in rare instances in the US and, and Europe, so you could do a subscription. In Asia, it's, it's dominant. The subscriptions are the main method with which. But very few people, even in Asia, have heard the phrase free to play. Uh, Nexon's Quiz Quiz may, may have been the first free to play game, and RuneScape and Mail, Maple Story came out shortly thereafter. And for mobile games, people are approaching us, even as we formed a new studio, and say, man, there's VC money. People really want games on their phones. And they're talking about games for flip phones. And, and there wasn't a, an app store. People would buy a, buy a game from their phone's interface that was different on every single carrier. They would pay the carrier in their phone bill. People would complain about their phone bills, and their kids would buy games on their phones, and then the developer or the publisher might get a small fraction of the money uh, from that. But there isn't an iPhone yet, there isn't an Android. The, the world is dramatically different. And from web game point of view, casual games are just really starting to take off. Big Fish is doing its very first hidden object game. It hasn't come out yet. At the end of 2006, Emily and her brother will found Congre Congregate. Um, Facebook is, in, is existing, but it's not outside of colleges yet. It's not a gaming platform. Zynga's a year and a half away with launching its Texan Hold'em Poker. Farmville is farther away than that, and it's going to be a long time before you even hear or play with HTML5. So, you get it. Making games in 2006, just 11 years ago, was dramatically different. And so why? And, and the real thing is, if you're going to have a studio, and you're looking at today, it's going to change. And I can't tell you that the last decade was dramatically different than the decade before, and I have no reason not to believe that the next decade isn't going to be as dramatically different as the last one. But I think people are going to pay for games, and how they do so is going to be completely different. The monetization models are going to be different. The methods of payment are going to be different. The way they find your games, the way they play your games, it's all going to change, and that's something that you as a developer, if you're having a new development studio or you're thinking about how do you fit in everything, you're going to have to consistently deal with throughout the, the lifetime of your studio. Um, with us faced with this as a studio, we're starting out, we're, we're making what, uh, you know, working for publishers to make games, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. We're starting to go, okay, how do we decide what opportunities we should focus on. And so we said, well, who are we and what are we good at? And that came to be a mantra we really held on to a lot. We started self-scouting after every project we did. Okay, what, what are, we, 
Are we showing that we're good at something? Are we showing maybe that we're, we're, there's an area maybe we shouldn't be in? Um, who are these people? What are they good at? How do you leverage their strengths so to give us opportunities that really give us a chance to set us apart and do better things? And how well does what we do well map to the potential of the business and creative success today? And I think especially for game developers, both are very equal. The people who just want to have their art seen by a lot of people, it's very hard for them to sustain in business. The people who just go chasing after dollars, it's very hard for them to really connect with an audience. That idea of really working to both business and creative success and really trying to entertain people and make money from entertaining people, I think is a, is a real goal that we think about a lot for us as our studio. And a lot of times people are saying, well, we're always judging to see if this particular game is what you're passionate about. And we keep saying, we're actually passionate about entertaining people. We're passionate about making games. And therefore, the change doesn't impact that passion as we move to different kinds of entertainment, as long as that's what we're really passionate about, entertaining people. So opportunities are going to come. Sometimes it's because you, you really beat the bushes and went looking for them. Sometimes they, you stumble into them. Sometimes it's because of people you know and situations you walk into. How do you evaluate them? How do you say which opportunities are right for us to go for? Which ones should we be chasing? Which ones should we not be chasing? And one of the things that we, um, we often ask for is, are these projects, if it works, good for both parties? Right? If we're working for somebody else or someone wants to finance us to do something, hey, when that is done at the end, is it good for the studio? Is it good for the financier or the publisher as well? And it's surprising how often it's really good for one party but not the others. The other thing, too, um, that will happen to you as a developer is someone will have a crisis. Their game development isn't going at the speed or the, the schedule that they wanted it to, and they need help. And you might know you can help them. You might be, whatever your skills are, whatever your particular talents are, might be a fit. But sometimes what they want you to do has a really low chance of actually being successful. And one of the things I think that has kept us in business for a while has been really avoiding the projects where the chance of it actually um, being successful is low. And even if we worked hard and tried to make it happen and it didn't happen, we didn't have, you know, we weren't angry at the people who pushed us to work extra hard and they aren't unhappy with us because we didn't deliver a miracle. Um, a lot of people really chase after those and it can get them in really hurt. You can't always choose which opportunities come to you, but you can decide how to respond. And that's building that framework that I've been talking about, about how we respond to opportunities, has been something I think we spent a lot of time at the studio. So now I'll tell you some stories about what we went through as a studio and what our opportunities looked like and what the ups and downs are and, and try and share some of the lessons along the way. For us, we got really fortunate. We secured, in the first year of business, starting off with just five people, um, three first-party games, not all at once, but over the course of that year. We were working for Microsoft on a, on a first-party project. We were working for Nintendo on another first-party project. And we were working for Sony on, a, on another uh, project. All of them were signed in the first year. We went from five people to 25 people. We had three independent teams that were you know, focused on their project. And um, also, all of them, during the project, had publisher changes. We, were, we started the project with someone, and then they left the project, and another person became the new one we were working with. Or the goals of that group changed what they were trying to accomplish. And you know, as a biased party who is saying, of course, we were doing our very best work and trying really hard, we believe that's the main reason that those were canceled. We, each of the cancellations appeared to be out of our control. It's hard to really know. You, you hear about it afterwards when things don't work. But we can say that they did correlate with changes along the way. And in fact, if we look at the history of the company and the dozens and dozens of projects we've done, the, almost every single successful product had the same people we worked with from the beginning to the end. And almost every project that had changes on it didn't work out. Um, it, I, I can't say it's causation, but it definitely was correlation. So we're sitting here, we built many games, but we hadn't shipped anything in the first two years. We're super frustrated, but very easy or eager to ship something we're, we're really proud of. 
And that leads into kind of trying to, this opportunity. We're going around, we're shipping, or we're, we're pitching, rather, pitching games. And we did. We got very fortunate. We signed one very large project that would cover most of the studio. It couldn't have covered all of the studio. But we were also successful at getting this small game called Defense Grid signed um, with some financing. And we were able to uh, get uh, Microsoft excited about it and get what was coveted at the time, very highly curated Xbox Live Arcade slot. And this, this was really cool. We thought, okay, we have a nice diversity of, of projects here. We've got this big, large AAA project going, and we've got this small, um, high-end tower defense title. And Defense Grid ended up being the very first thing we shipped, um, or one of the very first things we shipped as Hidden Path. Um, but surprisingly, it didn't even go as planned. It didn't actually ship first on Xbox Live Arcade. I'll finish the story here, but we actually cross into the Counter-Strike opportunity because of this. So our Counter-Strike opportunity really starts with Defense Grid. And if you want to know all the details, both about the making of the sequel and actually of this particular business situation, uh, there's a book written by Russ Pitts called How Video Games Are Made, My 16 Months Behind the Scenes in the Making of Defense Grid 2. I don't know what idiotic developer let a reporter sit with them uh, whenever they wanted to for 16 months, um, but we did. And uh, Russ really got super uh, interested in that and wrote about 10 articles for Polygon, where he was a reporter at the time. And then he took that plus a lot more material and he, he created the book you can get on Kindle if you would be so interested. Um, what the short version is, is that Defense Grid was planned for an Xbox Live Arcade exclusive. Um, along the theme, the people who were running Xbox Live Arcade at the time switched out. New people came in. Uh, they wanted to do a different deal and renegotiate the deal we had, um, such that when we were done with the game, we would have to wait another year to release it. We didn't like that as a small studio. We really needed the revenue that might come from shipping a game. And so we approached the folks at Steam and said, hey, would this be a possibility to ship with you? And they took a look at the game, and they said, hey, yeah, this would be the kind of thing we'd like on Steam. And so it was great. We went in, and we had been building it for Xbox Live Arcade. We knew Xbox features. We implemented a lot of Xbox Live features in the game. Um, the folks at Steam had, all, had built a lot of the same features. You guys all know them today, but again, this is 2008. It's very, very new. Um, and we went and just implemented the same things we would have done on Xbox Live on Steam. It turned out not many people were doing that. And so when we released Defense Grid, a lot of the folks at Valve were playing it. They said, oh, this is pretty good. You guys did a nice job. And we really actually like how, how you did the Steam feature implementation. Um, we know you're working on this big thing now, but could you have a small group of people? And would you mind um, helping you know, implement those Steam features on a game we're not working on right now, which happened to be Counter-Strike Source? No one at Valve was really working on it, and they said, hey, we like our Steam features, and we like how you did them. Maybe you guys could do that. So we did. We, we put a small group of five people on the project. Everyone else was on the big AAA project, and we're off and running. And awesome to disaster and back. Um, so the majority of the studios working on our dream game, um, a Korean publisher a year earlier had agreed to finance it. It was a kind of an interesting mix, a console and online game. Um, the, the appeal to the Korean publisher at the time was, oh, here's a way we can take what we know about online games, work with you who kind of know console and PC games for the West, and kind of combine those and bring out something new. Um, it never did ship, sadly, I apologize for that. Um, but uh, we're building, we're working on those, and months later, the Korean company had a very big leadership shakeup. Uh, four out of five board members that ran the company were removed by the main shareholder. And new people came in, and they said, well, North America is not part of our strategy anymore, and you're in North America, so we're, we're not funding this anymore. And I'm pretty confident that not much we could have done about that. We weren't ready to, to change continents. Um, so the game funding stopped. And uh, we shipped the game, shopped the games to other publishers and investors, but now we're in 2009, and the financial crisis hit in 2008, and shopping things and getting things picked up is a dramatically different environment. And people aren't financing things, people aren't funding things. The world of both publishers being very careful and financiers being very careful is very, very different. So we looked for new work. We um, landed a license-based project with a new publisher. We were very excited about it. And of course, it was canceled on the day it was supposed to start. 
because this is what happens to you sometimes when you're trying to make ends meet. And now we're really, really tight. Um, there was a thing on the previous slide. I'll go back because I should have brought it up. A small little anecdote. I, I didn't hit this last bullet point. When we started working for Valve on the Counter-Strike Source Steam features, we had an unusual conversation um, with their management that basically said, do not change out any of the people on the project. And we're like, OK, yeah, we wouldn't have done that anyway. We always keep our people separate. Uh, maybe you have a UI person who floats around. But in general, your programmers are separate, your designers are separate. But I guess they had had a relationship with a previous developer. Valve doesn't always have a ton of developer relationships. But they had had one with the previous developer. And they had felt like that developer had changed out the staff significantly on them, and they were unhappy with that. So they wanted to make it very clear to us we were never to do that. And we said, yep, no worries. We wouldn't have done it, but you've made it really clear. We know it's really important to you. So that project's canceled, and now we're in a cash strap situation because we spent most of our time and money shopping the big game that we had been working on. That didn't happen. We did get a gig, but then we waited to get the gig to start, and then on the day it starts, we're not having money. So we're now having the horrible layoff conversation that we didn't want to have. But we, we recognized that this, import, this thing about uh, Valve and the team changing was really important to them. So we called them up before we took any action, and we said, hey, we knew that changing the team was something you really don't want to have happen. We're probably going to do layoffs now because we've just you know, lost two projects in a row that we thought we were going to do. We're going to keep what we believe our best people are. That's going to mean some changes on your team um, as well. But we wanted to let you know before we took any action. And the uh, response was kind of amazing. It was, well, why don't we just hire your whole team to help us out? Yeah, and I'm like, I should have opened with that, huh? <laughs> Wouldn't, it didn't even occur to me that that was an option. And, and then they go, yeah, yeah, let's take a look at it. So let's come over to Valve the next day and let's see what kind of things you know, we could potentially work on together. And sometimes Valve doesn't need any help, but they were in the middle of shipping some big things. And there were some areas they would have liked to have uh, help with, so it kind of worked out. So almost all our artists went to learn about the right way to make uh, levels and props for Left 4 Dead 2. Our designers ended up working on Team Fortress 2 standalone experiences. And most of the programming staff and a few artists worked on bringing Counter-Strike Source to Xbox 360. Um, they just said, hey, let's, let's kind of divvy your team up. And this is a little different for us. We'd always been very team focused. We'd always been working on pretty much original project to this point. Um, and looking back, it appears that what Valve was doing, um, appropriately so, was kind of evaluating our strengths and weaknesses with each parts of our staff, of our 30 or so people. We had been working on our own project. We weren't anymore. But for us, one of our values was keeping the team together. We felt like if we built this team and got to work together and got used to each other, our ability to execute in a big way on something big later, because we all knew how to work well with each other and we could kind of maintain the staff, uh, that felt like a real strength. So this was a way for us to do that and also get to learn a, a lot about how Valve was approaching uh, their development. So the Counter-Strike for Xbox 360 took about eight months. It was just a straight bring this over, but make sure the UI and the uh, interface is appropriate for console, for console. also the controls. And uh, we did some UI upgrades, but no, no major design changes. At the end of that, they took a look at it and they went, wow. You guys kind of did that, and, and that kind of worked. You know, and, and the Left 4 Dead people are kind of done, and the Team Fortress people are kind of done. Why don't you get everyone back together, and why don't you guys go and take this a little bigger? Um, so let's move the project over to the Portal 2 engine. Let's, let's do this for both Xbox 360 and now PS3. And why don't you guys actually start making some new levels and some new content, and update the weapons and so forth, and kind of build a new thing? Let's, let's see where this can go. And we said, wow, that could take another year. And they said, yeah, that's kind of what we thought. OK. So off we go, and, and we're doing this. And we get a year later, and we're like, OK, we think we have this whole thing. Guys, take a look at this. What do you think? And they go, yeah, we've been thinking that maybe we should go even bigger. You, you wonder where valve time might come from. I, I, I submit it's continual evaluation of what they believe the right thing to do is and having no sunk cost fallacy. So they just said, no. And you know, that was the right thing to do a year ago. But I think the right thing to do now, 
We've got these two groups of Counter-Strike players, 1-6 players and Source players. And they, it, this religion is stronger than the Mac PC religion. This is stronger than PlayStation Xbox religion. This is which, team, which group really has the one true Counter-Strike. And there are things that both of them love about their game and they hate about the others. The movement, the jumping, the weapon patterns, the, the methods of, of how they interact with the game, uh, things like bunny hopping, and just where the, where the cheats are and so forth. Do you think we could take a goal where we try and create a new Counter-Strike product that could unify these, uh, this audience? We all looked at each other and we went, probably not, but we could try. Everyone goes, yep, that's probably true. So we, we figured we'd do a try. But the way we approached it is we said, we're going to data drive a unified movement jumping weapon model. If you knew anything about the code for Counter-Strike at the time, it Every weapon is a different DLL in, in the source and 1-6 days. Every, every firing pattern is a different uh, subroutine for each weapon, for each movement, for jumping. And so creating a single unified movement model seemed like a good idea. And then what we could do is we could data drive it to make it exactly like 1-6 and compare it. And then we could change the knobs and then make it exactly like source and compare it. And if those worked, then we could try finding this middle ground that might be appealing to both players. We also ended up growing to four platforms, PC, Mac, consoles, Linux servers, adding modes, mo uh, matchmaking, um, new ranking systems, a bunch of cool features. And then this is where I got to witness, and, and most of us at Hidden Path got to witness some of the most brilliant um, thing that I, I think I, I was aware of. Valve was really on, on uh, sharp with this. They said, you know what? If we're going to make a unified Counter-Strike, and we're starting to build it, and we've got the model in, and we've been going for a while, and, and people at Hidden Path and Valve are going, hey, this is kind of working, this is kind of fun. We don't know how Counter-Strike players are going to go yet, but um, let, let's invite some pros over and just say we want their feedback on Counter-Strike. We won't even tell them that there's a thing for them to play. And so Valve did this. They flew over from Europe a bunch of Counter-Strike source players um, come into Valve. We all went to dinner. They were, they were like, oh, you guys are, are, are involved with Counter-Strike and kind of said, yeah. And, and then they were kind of confused. There's hidden path people and Valve people and didn't make much sense. But they wanted to come and they wanted to vent about the, the pro circuit and how Source wasn't, a, wasn't becoming a continual viable platform for eSports and, uh, and the 1.6 CSS problem as they saw it. Went back to Valve, and uh, the Valve folks said, okay, hey, we actually are working on something, and we want your opinions on this, um, so just play it. And we all then stood with, with notebooks and walked around listening to them and getting their feedback, and they thought it was crap. Right? I mean, because this is not their Counter-Strike. It's different. It's horrible. It's awful. And, oh, well, that's not so bad. And I kind of like that, but you would never do that. And we're writing this down furiously and getting a completely different perspective on this game from the people who are playing it, trying to earn, you know, tournament money. And, uh, and then, you know, we go, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And they're kind of happy. And then the Valve folks go, okay, we're going to take you guys all to a Mariners game. And off they go. And because we had data-driven the system, we huddled Hidden Path and Valve folks and said, okay, what do you think we could change overnight based on all the feedback they gave us? And there were probably three main categories, maybe a dozen different things. We made a bunch of little changes. And the next day, um, Valve brought them in, and they played the game, and they loved it. They absolutely loved it. Now, there's some psychology involved here. They had asked for changes. And lo and behold, those changes are instantly made. The, the feedback they had just given, they were playing right now. But it blew them away. And this idea that they could be involved in where it was going and that it could make these slight changes that made a big difference to them all of a sudden made them advocates like I have never seen before in, in all of the game uh, promotions I've ever been a part of. Valve let them post freely to social media and they started talking about this amazing thing that was coming. We then went to PAX um, and uh, were able to show the game. It was pretty uh, un unbelievable. Um, this is an older game. We're excited to be showing it, but you've got League of Legends really making a splash on, on, uh, at PAX. You've got Borderlands 2 coming out. But Counter-Strike is all of a sudden third or fourth most popular thing at PAX West that year. And I think that blew all of us away. It was not something that any of us really expected. 
Um, and then Valve decided to get right behind tournaments a little bit more. And I tell you, you work on a game, you play it, you play it with each other, you kind of get to know it, you feel it. But then when you see people actually playing it in tournaments and seeing it in a serious way, you start looking at it in completely differently. Um, I tried to find the 2011, 2012 uh, footage. I, I couldn't, but uh, the, this, here's a thing from 2015 that kind of gives you an idea. Oh, I think pistol round is about to start here. 10 seconds left. Oh. Okay, quick prediction. Coming into this one, three maps, and I'll put you on the spot. Oh, now then. Well, I really do think it's going to be a three mapper. I'm going to tip it in favor of Envious, but we have to see how this first map unfolds. It's going to be such a close one. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. It is the ESO One Cologne Finals. It is Fnatic versus Envious. The pistol round is underway. Here we go, then. Fast. The B tunnels. One player look, but the CTs have got some aggression to They're trying to get as much as possible. Oh no, this could be a big problem here. If Happy goes down, a lot of the setup for Envy is going to be... But look at this, he actually sees two people. Flusher, blind shot, takes down Apex, and now they're in the B-bomb side. Flusher getting a chance to reload back up. He's already here. Makiyoshima with a stunning shot to shot down all of Meister. It's now a 4v4. JW still alive. Kenny gets a kill on Frims. Flusher in the back lines. He's out of ammo. <laughs> a knife is out. What's happening? Flusher, he's oh. getting stabbed. He goes down. He drops Flusher. It's going to be a two v two. No boss land, and there it is. Happy double kill and envy. They take the pistol. Amazing stuff there. We saw the CTs pushing to try and get some information at the start of the round. The quick execution into B. We were such pandemonium. And look at this moment. Both players running out of ammo on the platform, and MBK taking the knife. There. Amazing stuff there. And what a brilliant start for Team Envious as they take the first round on Dustin. It, it kind of changes your perspective of the project you're working on when you see stuff like that. So we were fortunate enough to work with Valve and learn a lot about how they did beta processes. We, we did eight months um, with 18 updates, weekly updates at first, and uh, then after every few weeks thereafter. And, and we learned a bunch of stuff. Um, first, we started with the pros, then about 10,000 players per week, then lots of growth. But there was a lot of direct forum uh, communication, and it was really interesting. One of the things that I think was super valuable is that the releases were very specific and coordinated, and that was fully communicated to the player base. Um, it was coordinated that we set up the metrics in the collection ahead of time, and players got advance warning on what the test of the week was going to be. And so everyone who would be playing was kind of knowing this is what's being studied, and this is what's being evaluated. And then we could plan our possible responses to the data before the test even took place. If the data comes back this way, we might go this way. If the data comes back a different way, we might change. And of course, if, if it came back completely unexpectedly, we could you know, do something completely different. But, um, but that really led to a very efficient beta process that I highly recommend. Um, some of the insights was that uh, one of the things that really was cool is that after this data was collected and we you know, look at the graphs and understand it, Valve presented that data to the community and said, here's what just happened. Here's what you all did. And now the dialogue on the forums completely change. It's not about, hey, I don't like the changes you're about to make or the changes you just made. It's, well, what should you do with this data? And, and, and you actually elevate the level of the discussion on the forums because they're now in it with you talking about, wow, is that, that is exactly right way it should be, or no, it isn't, or why isn't it? And one of the things that really this enabled was players to debate amongst themselves rather than debating against you. And this was huge, especially for a, a community that's not necessarily the friendliest and calmest community in the world. Um, the other lesson was really valuable is to do polls in-game, not in forums. People will respond to polls, but a subset of your audience goes to forums. And the silent majority can make themselves very well known with an in-game poll, whereas a forum post or questions or reading from the forums won't necessarily uh, tell you that information as much. Metrics often was something we relied on much more, but we did do a few polls. Um, when dealing with the audience, we learned to respond directly to people who were really helpful. It could be negative feedback, but they were helpful. And we resp responded indirectly to people 
who uh, were just being trolls or being difficult. And the reason this worked is that attention and reputation are really that currency of the community. And if the developers are calling out this person who's being super useful for aggregating all these other threads and putting it in a place that's really easy to use, other people want to do that too. And then all of a sudden, your community is actually working with you as opposed to against you. Um, the other thing, I mean, this is common. I think people run into this. But a lot of people will make suggestions. Their suggestions typically are not good. They're not good inherently because they don't have all the information that you as a game designer are having to deal with, right? You have a ton of knobs. They see one knob. They say it needs to be cranked all the way to one side. That would ba take your system completely out of balance. They can't understand that. But don't mistake a bad suggestion for a poor identification of a problem. Often when they identify that there's a problem, they're right. The fact that they may not have the right solution doesn't mean you should ignore it. So some years later, we got a VR opportunity. And as with everything, our virtual reality, our virtu virtual reality story actually starts with Defense Grid. You, you can read about Defense Grid in this book now. Um, the VR story actually happens after the book, but um, in about 2014, we, uh, Mark Toronto, our chief creative officer, um, you'll see a little bit about him in a bit, uh, said, hey, I really, um, really want to do some of this VR. It looks really interesting. And we started approaching uh, Oculus. We knew some people there about possibly doing demos for them. And uh, we, we sat down, we met with them, but they said, no, we're, we're not really interested in doing that. And then the... Uh, Opportunity came nine months later, got an email out of the blue, can we meet next week? This is GDC 2015. We say, sure. And they said, we think your game would be great for VR. And often at this point in time, people would say, your game. We'd say, you got to understand, Counter-Strike's not our game, it's Valve's game. We worked with them on it. And they go, no, no, no not, not Counter-Strike, Defense Grid. And we looked at them a little funny and we said, why would anyone want Defense Grid in VR? This is a game we love, we've worked on for a long time. We know inside and out. We have never associated this with VR. It doesn't make any sense to us. And Oculus kind of said, well, actually, VR experiences involve a lot of things. They involve your perspective, how you see what the world is around you, the movement, how you're going to move or not move, or whether it's an extreme movement inside it, the presence, your, your relationship with the world and how you see yourself in the world, what you're focused on, and what your power relationship is if you're controlling things or if you're interacting with things. And according to Oculus, it turns out that many different audiences value different traits much differently, but one area that seems to be very common as they were trying out a bunch of their demos was a God view, stationary, full control of a miniature world that had animating moving pieces that you could get down and look close at. They said pretty much everybody who likes VR seems to like that, and we think Defense Grid would be a good version of that. I went, oh, okay. So we put a, a, a camera, a 3D camera, just in our existing defense grid levels to kind of see what that would be like, and we were blown away. We know this game inside and out, and we're going, this game is so much better in VR. It would have never occurred to us. It was totally Oculus's idea. And this slide may seem similar. Um, at the same time, the majority of the studio was working on a new dream game, a new Korean publisher, had agreed to finance an original AAA online game. This was PC online only. And so at this time, we had two projects, a large AAA game and a small team working on defense grid, changing Defense Grid to work in VR. Um, have a lot of UI, UX changes to really make it so that it would be native and, uh, and feel right in VR. Sadly, months later, the Korean company had a minor leadership shakeup. Um, the replacements of, uh, in the shakeup, our, our project moved from one organization to a subsidiary. The subsidiary had the shakeup, and all of a sudden they were not interested in making the genre of game that we were making. And the game funding stopped. The joys of up and downs. Fortunately for us, um, Oculus said, well, hey, why don't we just have your whole team do VR? Because um, we really like what you're doing on Defense Grid 2. So each time these little side projects that were kind of, hey, that'd be kind of cool to do while we're doing our main thing, ended up becoming the main thing we did afterwards. It's kind of strange sometimes. Um, Google got interested after playing Defense Grid as well, and we did a VR title for them for Daydream. 
Um, we, along the way, we've had to solve some interesting problems over the last two and a half years in VR, and we have some tech now that might even be worth patenting. And we also have uh, what we believe, it's, Oculus is uh, looking at it as one of their major titles this fall. It's called Brass Tactics. And here's the trailer. So we're really excited about that. Oh, thank you. Um, the opportunity to actually make a full RTS in VR is, has been really exciting. Um, that was uh, footage from uh, February, and uh, we'll be showing some new footage and uh, as, as we get to uh, PAX West and so forth coming up. But uh, yeah, the game is, is uh, we love it. Um, we would like there to be a, a large VR audience to play it, and we'll, we'll see what happens. But suddenly, because of this side thing, we're a VR studio now, and we've gotten the opportunities to make several VR titles, and now two and a half years, five titles, and by the end of this year, nine releases on four VR platforms. We're getting pretty experienced at making VR games. It didn't, this was not a strategic plan. Um, there is so much more for us to learn but we're starting to realize as we talk with people who are either new to VR or have been in VR a little while, it's like, oh yeah, we remember when we were dealing with those problems, or oh yeah, we, we, we work with that. And, and for this game, VR is, is in many ways so game specific that even lessons you learn from one game, as we've done five or six different games, the lessons aren't quite the same for the other games. It's really, it, it, this is a mind-blowingly large design space if you have not already jumped in. Um, compared to so many other things we've learned about other game design. But we've still got so much to learn, yet we have learned so much, and it's been awesome. And we feel like this continual education about really deconstructing games, deconstructing mechanics, understanding what's good when you think about physical presence and where I am and what my interactions are, are making us a better game studio. Um, some things that we've learned that I can share a little bit about VR, and we can, you know, this itself could have been perhaps a whole talk, but UI and UX really is like starting over. Um, the HUD concepts, motion concepts, comfort concepts, we are so good at putting stuff up on a 2D screen. We know how to use the corners, we know how to use the bottom, what to put up center, what to put down low. O over dozens of years, we've gotten really good at that. Once you start trying to give information to players in VR, it becomes a completely different thing. Um, things attached to your head may be good, often are not. Um, different, different ways of displaying things, we're really used to changing font size, color, um, pixel size perhaps, but in VR you're dealing with comfortable interaction distances, angle ranges of comfort focal depth planes, interpupillary distances, which change the size you feel to the size of the objects. And all of those, unfortunately, are interrelated. You change one, you're messing with the others. And so now, if you want something to appear a certain way and for you to have an emotional connection with it in a certain way, you are playing with a lot of knobs that we weren't playing with before. Um, and all of them affect the feel of the game. I would also say that one thing we keep joking about in the studio is how non-linear our design iterations are. Um, with many years of making a shooter or making a real-time strategy game, you go, okay, I've got a mechanic, I wanna try this. Oh, it didn't quite work, I'm gonna change it. It's gonna be better or worse, better or worse. It's a common thing. Turns out in VR, better or worse is really hard to evaluate alone, and a lot of really good ideas are completely surrounded by horrible ideas, but just a small change makes them really good or really bad, which makes iteration really challenging. 
um, the polish that you need to put on something to even decide whether or not you like it seems to us to be much, much higher. In the past, we could put up a graphics and kind of go, oh, I can kind of imagine how that might animate in and how it might move and how easy it would be to pick and what, what sounds I might add to it later. But now, actually, we put up a, a variety of different menus or pop-ups and we can try them and go, they all suck. And then we add haptic to them and we go, okay, those suck less. And then we add sound effects to them and then, okay, those suck less. And then we actually make the animation the way we think it should be and then we go, oh, that's the one. But we didn't do it until we actually polished a lot of them. So it's more expensive to go hunting for what's the right thing in VR than it was at least prior to that for us in regular games. Um, the physical interactions and your way your controls, a lot of VR, and I think appropriately so, is moving towards, I want to physically be somewhere and physically interact. Well, as game designers, we often know we've got a game controller, we've got D-pads, we've got sticks, we've got buttons, we've got triggers, and if we need a new feature, oh, maybe that goes up on the right button, or maybe that goes on the left D-pad. But with physical interaction, if I'm picking these things up and I'm tossing them, and maybe I'm using another thing to pull something down, and now I want to add a new verb, I don't have a lot of buttons more, or I've already used them. Context sensitive is a little more confusing in VR. And so you end up redoing all your verbs every time you decide you want to add a verb. One of the reasons you know, people say, Mostly, when you take games to, from regular to VR, it doesn't work, and I would agree. I think Defense Grid was a big outlier in part because a lot of things you want to do in VR you were already doing in the game, and the verb count for the game was extremely low. One of the goals of the original Defense Grid design was I could play with one hand and have a beer in the other. These are key design elements, tenets. But that only having one set of very simple verbs actually made it a lot easier to bring it to VR because the, you don't want to overload the player with a ton of things they could do. The player communication bandwidth is probably one of the weirdest things that we've learned. If I put on a 2D screen, if I put a rock at the top of the screen, you look at it and you go, why is there a rock at the top of the screen? You know, and your character is running around. No big deal. But if you have the headset on, and there's a rock floating up above your head, you move, and then the rock comes with you, and then you move, and you get uncomfortable. And we're actually, you know, your, your, your lizard brain is saying, I should not be standing under rocks. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you realize you are communicating with the player in ways that you were not on the 2D screen. You're connecting to a part of their brain just by putting a physical object in a space You've had 3D spaces before. You've had 3D characters move through those spaces before. They haven't impacted the player and had the same emotional impact that you can in VR. And so all of a sudden, you have to be really careful. I don't know if you've seen this. Uh, IGN did a review of Paranormal Activity. And Kristen did not start crawling on the ground. She was standing. She was playing. She got so frightened she curled down into a fatal position while wailing. Makes good YouTube material, right? If you, if you like watching other people get way too scared. But all of a sudden you realize, you know, if, if theater is yelling and film is whispering, you are barely making any noise at all in VR. You are so right there in the information you can give to a player. And scaring people is super easy. And if you go really hard on it, you can make people go, I'm not sure this is the entertainment medium for me. Now, some people are going to seek that out and want that. And there's every reason in the world that entertainment should be there. But just understanding that you as a developer in VR have that kind of power to really impact other people's emotions is something that's pretty eye-opening. Um, and the other thing, too, is that once you do a lot of VR development, you start getting used to things. Um, our lead, one of our uh, leads just went uh, to a family gathering and was up high on the side of a cliff and was really surprised that he did not have vertigo like he has his entire life. And he suspects that the last year of working with VR probably changed that. Um, that may be an extreme example, but I would say that when you test and when you iterate, when it's good for you is not the time to stop. You want to bring in people who are new to VR, other people who have played some VR things, it, it, it turns out you, you do build up um, some immunity or some different perspectives the more hours you put into VR yourself, which takes away your new perspective ability over time. 
Um, people ask, why, wait, wait a minute, you've got a company, you're trying to be in business, why are you in VR? And, and it's true, right now, VR games as a sector are not selling very well. The, the top out, outliers are making more than a million dollars, which is great, but I've already talked about VR games are hard to make, they often take longer to make, they're, they're more expensive, so the return on investment upside is really low, and a lot of the ROI is downside. If, if you're investing your own money. We've been really fortunate to find opportunities where people are giving us the opportunities to make games so that their platforms will, will be there. We believe this market is coming, and we think once the market's coming, then our ability to actually get a return on our own investment will definitely be there. Um, the public also is so used to really high quality experiences, trying to match those high quality experiences in VR is a really daunting task. So if, if it's not a great business today, why, why are we there? And again, we kind of come back to how we evaluate opportunities that I was talking, at the, talking about at the beginning of the talk. Um, we believe that our studio and the people we've hired are really good at making high quality entertainment. And VR seems to be a place where that is rewarded. People like it when they get that high quality entertainment. Mobile is probably not the best place for us as an example. Mobile, as, as you guys were hearing, um, people talked about today, acquisition and, and trying to get people in is, is a fundamental part of it. And there is debate whether or not the quality is even a, as a significant a factor in a mobile product. Um, I think it is a factor, but uh, we want to go with the places where it's the greatest factor if we can, because that's our strength. Um, the IP opportunity has probably been the biggest thing that really sold us. Um, if you are a VR developer and if you can demonstrate it or you can fall into it like we did, the kinds of agreements that people are making with you um, are better than a typical development agreement because they know there's not a very good market there. So often you get to create new things, create new intellectual property, work in different genres than perhaps we were able to work in before and show our skills off so that if VR goes away, we actually now have a portfolio we can show people and say, actually, yeah, we're a pretty good platformer studio. I, never, I know you never thought of us as a platformer studio, but a lot of people think which blood is really pretty special and actually we can do platformers or we can do real-time strategy or you know, tower defense, obviously, shooters. Um, but adventure games and arcade games, some places where we weren't before, we've been able to take advantage of, uh, art, of VR for that. If VR does happen as we hope, we're well positioned for it. And I think one of the most important things is we're learning a ton and we feel like we're really leveling up the studio on our design skills and our evaluation, our deconstruction of what's actually happening and why. And that's really valuable for us. So opportunities come from many different places. I will not underestimate luck. Um, people say, oh, you have to make your own luck. Well, sometimes that's just going out and trying and trying and trying. And most of what I see from the indie community is a consistent basis of that. Um, sometimes it's about your ambition, what you want to make. Sometimes it's about survival. Sometimes it's about luck, timing. But I think the thing that's really important is understanding your values and goals to then decide which opportunities are not the right ones for you and which ones are the shots for you. For us, it's about making high quality games, sticking with our strengths, focus on great design. And it has been also about keeping the team together, which gives us more opportunities I'm really proud of the team. Um, Oculus, as they have with most of their uh, first year developers, sent a documentary team out to go do stories on each of the development teams. And I figured I'd share, you, uh, share with you the one about our team. When I was growing up and my parents first took me to Disneyland and I went on Pirates of the Caribbean and the Haunted Mansion and these amazing experiences just kind of washed over me. I've always wanted to be able to give people those kinds of experiences. I started college when I was 14, and I was always several grades ahead in math. And I think that a lot of that has still carries over to my psychology, where I always feel like I need to push a little harder and show why I should be where I am. When I got into computer science, my professor said, if you're in this for games, you've got like such a slim chance, one in a thousand. That was extremely motivating to me because it's like, if anybody can do it, I can do it. I just want you to tell the story of the people here. I think it's a story worth telling. I'm Jeff Bobst. I'm CEO and founder of Hidden Path Entertainment. I have been known most of my life as a catalyst. 
My parents would tell me the story that they'd have a dinner party and lots of friends would come over and they'd be all over in different parts of the house. And they were saying, oh yeah, I was talking with Jeff over here. And they go, no, you weren't, because I was talking with Jeff over here. No, no, because I was talking with Jeff over here. I've gone to GDC many times with Jeff, and he's one of those people where you can't go anywhere. You're going to get stopped like 15 times on the way by people who are walking the other direction. I really, really like Jeff because while he's really good at the business side, he's also uh, very compassionate and thinks a lot about doing the right thing. And I think that that combination of traits can sometimes be rare. Michael Austin is one of the smartest people I know. He is not only technically smart, but he works hard to understand the why of things, the why about everything. When Michael and I met, he was just this young, super genius guy, really fantastic, could kind of do anything. And I had some crazy ideas. I said, you know, our clients are all having this problem with graphics and with balancing it out. Could we in real time adjust the colors? And like a week later, he said, okay, that kind of got me inspired. So he made this tool that would let people adjust the color gamut of their game in real time and that had never been done before. I was kind of the VR pioneer. I backed the DK1 and was evangelizing it to the other partners. So I was like, oh, Michael, come over to my house, you know, check this stuff out. So I had been doing VR and doing my own research and things and following what was happening. Mark just always has a completely different way of looking at things that are, you know, sometimes at first don't seem like they're super significant, but then you realize over time that they're hugely significant. One of the things that happened when I came here to Hidden Path was that I met a bunch of people who are way smarter than I am and way better at all kinds of things that I'm not good at. And I learned in that team collaborative environment, we can do great things that are better than any of us could do by ourselves. Welcome to Defense Grid 2. When I first came in, I was trying to come up to speed on, okay, what is the story that we're trying to tell with Defense Grid? Beyond kind of the obvious, oh, you're shooting aliens with towers. This is in fact where the alien masterminds enslave the beasts they use for their armies. For the VR version, we added five new levels, and we were coming up with a story arc for them, and we actually went back closer to the original Defense Grid. It is very satisfying and nostalgic for me to get back to that root of the simple story of you and your friend and supporting each other through hardship. VR is so new, everything has to be looked at with fresh eyes. It's like you can't go, oh, we'll just do subtitles like we've always done, and we'll just do this mechanic like we've always done it. Everything has to be rediscovered, and it's, it's super exciting. As soon as we put the camera in the game, it was obvious that this was a cool thing. It was little miniatures you wanted to get down, poke your head in, and look at things. But interface was all completely different, so we had to really reinvent that from scratch. Defense Grid 2 is a custom engine. It's not based off of any other proprietary engine, such as Unreal or Unity. Once we started working in VR, we had a lot more ability to look around. And one thing that I felt like could be improved was the water. The water had a lot of really interesting math. It didn't look horrible, but I started digging into it and said, I can make this better. He came and said, look at the water. And I'm like, that's fantastic. I think the best thing about David is that he has the ability to tunnel down kind of the rabbit hole into any problem that we, we give him and like really get to the bottom of it and come back with these really elegant solutions. Everybody has design input, so it's not ivory tower design where we go, oh, on high, here's the blessed design document, now go and implement. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Early on, I figured out with programming that I can create worlds. People playing in my virtual world with me, it is part of their life. It is not something that they do on the side. What excites me the most about VR is the way that it has this ability to completely take over all our senses. One of the things we're really trying to do is create these escapist experiences that kind of takes them away from their normal life. I think following that level of immersivity and that level of social in VR is something that could open up for us and we could be exceptionally good at entertaining people so that they're having fun together in places their minds have only dreamed. makes coming to work every day so much fun is the people that I get to work with. And the thing that we face each day and we know is coming is change. Um, we'll be, you know, striving to do what we can to entertain as many people as we can, um, trying to improve our studio and our culture and our throughput for each project that we do. Um, we really can, because of the passion we have for making games, be excited about whatever 
opportunity is going to come next. But if we've learned anything over the last 11 years, it's that we have no way possible of predicting what that's going to be. Um, so hopefully this uh, helped out a little bit. You got to, you got to hear about another developer uh, navigating their ups and downs and how sometimes the downs turned into ups. Um, looking at how we try and evaluate opportunities and how we think about which things we'll do and which things we won't and maybe uh, get a little bit of the insight into some of the community interaction we did on Counter-Strike and uh, some of the things we've learned from VR. Thank you guys very much.